Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Form and Community Demo. Uh, I remind you that since we are not live, uh, no more questions on YouTube for now. Uh, therefore, you can find us on IRC on the Foreman or on uh, Foreman Project on Twitter. So questions to there. For those of you who are watching on YouTube, please up the video quality. The default is not great with our screen sharing. Not a whole lot of community updates for today, uh, but I do want to thank all of the speakers and the attendees for DevCon, Config Management Camp, and FOSTEM. Uh, it was great to see so many people there. Uh, I only saw it through pictures, but from what I hear, it was wonderful. Again, so thank you for everyone, for our speakers, and everyone who came to see us at the booth and in the room. Great seeing you again this year. And we'll start. We have pretty full schedule today. So, Tomer, to you about the upcoming Foreman version. Um, so, in case you missed the previous demos, uh, Foreman 2.0 is coming out. Um, we are going to have RC1 out probably today or tomorrow. Um, so, we would really appreciate a lot of testing around it. Um, there's been some pretty significant architectural changes. Uh, and we are sure those probably things that need updating in the manual as well. So um, contributions to the manual are very welcome. You don't even have to be a developer to contribute. It's just a markdown file. You can even edit it from the GitHub UI um, and submit a PR. You don't need to actually um, do any of the uh, manual Git work. Um, so it's a really good way to start contributing. Uh, and we appreciate those contributions. Um, following 2.0, we'll have Foreman 2.1, as usual, three months later. Um, and we are going to continue with the 2.x series uh, for uh, a bit, but I'm promising you that we won't get to 2.24 before we get to Foreman 3.0, um, which is uh, probably going to be in about a year or so. Um, still haven't decided specifically, but it depends on when we have a release that we want to do some significant changes in that warrants a new major release. Uh, Foreman 2.0, for those who are new to the project, is the first major release we've had in about five years or even more, actually. Um, so it's quite a big achievement. Uh, I want to thank everyone who was involved in doing that. But now is the time to think of what we want to achieve for Foreman 3.0 um, and hopefully uh, make a better project for everyone. Uh, we're trying to make it simpler to use and focus on the things that we do best. Uh, we got some really good feedback in the community survey that just closed today. And we will be using that as another um, source of input for what we want to work on. Um, but if you have some ideas or some major changes that you think we should do in Foreman, um, now is a really good time to propose them. So please come on this course and open uh, discussion, suggest your uh, proposal. Um, we have a, an RFC category under the development uh, category. So that's a really good place uh, for bringing up suggestions and um, discussing them and pitching some sort of agreement on what should be done. Um, so please do that. And um, thank you again for everyone who was involved in this release. Thanks, Tomer. Moving on, we have John Mitch talking about stable Catal development environment and forklift. John, to you. Thanks, Ori. Let me share my screen. All right, hello everyone. I'm John, I'm on the Catello team. Um, and I wanna talk about in addition to Forklift uh, to add a Catello stable development environment. So before I get into everything, I'm actually going to spin one up now. And it's gonna spin up as I talk. It is downloading the box, great. Um, so what is it, what is the Catello stable development environment and why did we need it? Um, so Forklift is our repository, our tool for spinning up development VMs using Vagrant. And traditionally, we have spun them up, um, used a base 
configure an image and run a playbook on it, which runs locally. Um, the issue with that is that we will see failures in that playbook. Um, you'll see changes of dependencies, installer changes, DB migrations, things like that. Uh, and this was frustrating in itself that you couldn't spin up a development environment. Um, but you also saw some side effects of this, is that developers would keep environments around a long time. Um, be, they would be scared to ever destroy one or keep multiple ones around uh, and older ones. Um, and then we get people using development environments for you know six months with outdated packages. So you get, oh, this works on my machine. Oh, what version packages do you have? So all around did not really, uh, or, or there were just some things, some areas that we could improve on. So I was brainstorming on how to go about this in a different way. And I came up with the idea of publishing a Vagrant image with the full Catello development environment in it uh, and was able to get that working. So traditionally, what we do is Vagrant up, we get CentOS 7 image from Vagrant Cloud, um, and this all happens when you Vagrant up behind the scenes. And then it runs the Ansible playbook with that installs the whole Catello development environment locally, and the box is created. So if the playbook succeeds, you have a Catello development environment, but when it doesn't succeed, uh, that's when you start saying, oh, what's wrong, what's broken? Um, and a lot of times that the failures are not fixed for a while because of various reasons. So to get an environment that's always available, the, what I've set up is a uh, automated job on a separate server that uses Packer to build a box from a box image from a template. And Packer is a tool that Vagrant provides to actually build these box images. So the way Packer works is it bootstraps CentOS 7. Um, it does that with an ISO and Kickstarter file, and then it runs the Ansible playbook installing the Catello development environment. And if that succeeds, and only if that succeeds, then the box image is published to Vagrant Cloud, which right now is under Catello slash Catello Devel. And it uses a date string as the version, so it can guarantee the latest box is always the latest version. That's why you have this ridiculously huge version here. And then locally, so that's all happening, um, and you don't have to really worry about that as a developer, but it's just, it kind of uh, helps to think about it that way. Um, and then locally as a developer or someone who is spinning off a box, you just run Vagrant up, and it downloads the latest Catello develop image and the Catello development is in it the Catello develop environment is ready. Uh, so that's what's going on here. It's still um it just downloaded the image and now it's spinning it up. And one nice feature of this is it's it's much faster because you're not running any of the install steps locally. It's basically just the time to get the image over the wire. Uh, so there are some subtle differences all in all the end result should be the same as CentOS 7 Catello Devel and CentOS 7 Catello Devel stable box. They should be the same end result, but there's some kind of subtle differences here. Um, the big one is when you first spin up the box, it's gonna download the latest image. So uh, for here, that is this image here. It was published two hours ago, great. Um, but if I were to spin up a box next week and there were new images published, I would have to run this box update command. And that would actually update the underlying image. We're not really used to doing that because we basically, we base our boxes on CentOS 7. Um, you can see they're not uh, frequently updating this. It's not a huge deal if you don't update your underlying box image. Um, I think I've only done it like once or twice over the years. So that's something to get used to. It's a little different uh, than what we normally do. The other thing is it's the Corman and Catella install is happening on a third party server or just a, a separate server. So GitHub remotes are not configured. That's something we're trying to figure out. And it's also a good idea to pull Git branches, gems, NPM packages, update all that. 
Um, right now, it's not a huge deal. You're you're getting the latest stuff from two hours ago, but I've seen it when things do break and we're relying on an older box image. Um, I've seen it go like a month of using an older box image, which means you're using the versions, the NPM packages, and the Git branches from a month ago. So it's a good idea to just go and update all those after spinning up a stable box. So the other aspect of this is there are, um, this is a separate feature I added, but it's kind of tangential, tangential to this, is that you can customize the development environment to copy over your bash, or your dot files, um, run scripts. Uh, I found this to be really helpful, like for instance, for bash RC, vim RC, green RC, pry RC, all those files, and then also to install packages like screen, to install uh, any, if you use a certain text editor or anything like that, it's been really nice. Um, so that information, I'm not gonna really get into that too much. You might see it after this spins up, um, the end result, but the, all the docs are in forklift itself. So yeah, the takeaways, Pentos 7 can tell the Vel stable, it's reliable and spins up quickly. Um, you vagrant up the first time, and then the next time you want to vagrant up and update the box, you want to make sure you vagrant box update. Just always refer to the forklift docs. I'm doing my best to keep those up to date and uh, in an easy to read format. And you can customize it with your own dot files and scripts using the personalization. So here, this just finished, very timely. And I have a full Catello development environment from starting from nothing. And it is customized the way I like it. You can see it has a nice, uh, pretty colors there. And I can start a server. This is just a little alias I have for that, which is already set up because my bash RC is copied over. And you can see a server is starting there. And that's it. Thanks, John. Moving to Jeremy about using the new Formidal React component. I can see your screen, Jeremy, but I can't hear you. Jeremy, we can't, we still can't hear you. Okay. Um, Maybe we'll move forward and Jeremy try to rejoin. Okay. So moving on in the meantime, uh, Andre about the Audible Select and uh, VMware Boot Order. Okay, so I will first describe uh, why uh, orderable select uh, was created in the first place. What was the issue? I was trying trying to solve by it. So in the VMware VMware provisioning, we can well for every provisioning we have the first uh, bootable method as uh, set up as the uh, network, but if you uh, set this uh, on VMware to API, you end up with uh, something like this. 
Uh, so all your devices are before the hard drive. Uh, and you cannot uh, edit it in any way manually. So, well, you can, but it would be pretty hard for you to edit some internal file in VMware. So it's really user unfriendly. And for some networks, it can be pretty tough uh, to uh, have uh, some setup that will not boot the provision server, but will will boot uh, the non provision provisioned ones. So uh, some some setups may may need to put the hard disk uh, as a first device, and maybe uh, all of them if you are doing provisioning from uh, empty hard hard drive it will skip the hard disk entirely so it will work better for you so what we needed was some way how to how to edit an order in in that booting because we it would be easy to sh to show it but ordering it we had no way to provide an input for it so what I did uh, is orderable select. You can see it in the in the storybook uh, of Foreman. In the form section, there's orderable select, and what it is, it's just ordinary uh, multiple select, which you can use as such, but with addition that I can drag and drop the items that I've selected. So uh, now I can use it and I can use it in the VMware virtual machine, virtual machine order, uh, boot order. And as you can see, I have network and hard disk here and I can add CD-ROM and floppy disk if I would need need so. But for now, I just want to put a hard disk in front of the network. And I have all the other attributes set it up. So go ahead and hit submit. And hopefully, play a machine for me, Ricky Brito. I go ahead, open that up. Skip the hard disk obviously because mm -hmm. go to the boot section. I can see that I have the hard drive first or next. So on the first uh, first boot up, I will get the get the network provision obviously because the hard disk empty, and then once it's provisioned, we'll kick on the hard disk. So oh, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, we have Jeremy back. Jeremy, can you try to talk? Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Let me try to share again here. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so uh, hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm also on the Catella team, John, but I've been working on UI stuff uh, for the past several months, so I wanted to share with you uh, Foreman Modal. It is a new React component in Foreman that I've been working on. It's a wrapper around the Patternfly 3 uh, Modal React component, and it, it can be used across Foreman and plugins. And uh, what's interesting about it is that it, it's integrated into Foreman's Redux store, so you can manage and keep track of several modals in a single place. Um, so, like, when, whenever you build something new, I always think it's a good idea to ask why. Like, why not just use the pattern fly modal component? So, in thinking about this, there are a couple of compelling reasons that I could think of. First of all, it's a single API across all of Foreman and Plugin. So if, if we ever decide to change the underlying modal component, maybe upgrade to Pattern Fly 4 or make other changes, 
we can update that in a single place instead of everywhere there's a modal in the application. Uh, kind of tied in with that is uh, testing. Makes testing simpler because the basic tests are already there. You, the render tests and modal opens, modal closes when it's supposed to. That's there, it's tested once, and you don't have to test it every time you add a new modal to the application. And then finally, it's an opinionated built-in way to connect your modal state to Redux. Uh, looking at the existing modal implementations in Foreman, um, I noticed we were kind of already doing this. Um, we just have a habit of putting everything in Redux. So there's there are a ton of, uh, you know, is modal open Redux states around, and this, this kind of gathers everything into one place. Uh, so as far as basic usage, um, the biggest difference between Foreman Modal and other Modal React components that you may have seen is it doesn't have an open or on close prop or anything. Instead, you just pass in an ID prop and everything is controlled via Redux actions that refer to that ID. Um, so you have your set modal open and set modal closed actions, and then we have one selector that we provide that tells you your current modal state. So here's what it looks like in the Foreman Redux store. This is actually from our subscriptions page in Catello. Um, you see the, on the left there the Foreman modals key, and you can see how it's managing several modals in a single place with their open states there. And then on the right side, you can see the actions. Uh, add modal you don't even have to worry about, that's taken care of for you, and then the set modal open and set modal closed. Uh, they're just very simple objects as good Redux actions should be. So if you're wondering how to get started, uh, recommended approaches, I recommend primarily to use React hooks if you can. We have a great uh, custom hook that we provide called Use Form and Modal. You just pass in the ID and it makes everything really easy for you. Um, if you have a class-based component that you don't want to refactor, or if you're just old-fashioned, you can also use it in the way that you're used to without hooks, with uh, map state to props and map dispatch to props. So uh, here's an example of how it's used uh, using hooks. You can see there, um, I don't know if you can see the line numbers, but on line six, we call the hook use form and modal, and it gives us back three things. Uh, you get the modal open Boolean, and, the, and then you get two functions to set the modal open and set modal closed. And you don't have to deal with Redux yourself at all. The hook takes care of that for you, so it, it makes it really easy. And then you notice we pass in the modal ID there, and also in the markup on line 14, we pass the same ID as a prop. And as long as those two IDs match, then everything will work great. Um, so as you know, React hooks don't work with class-based components, so you can also do it kind of the old way. Um, nothing too earth-shattering here. We use map state props to give our component the modal open Boolean, so we know the current state, and then we use map dispatch to props to give ourselves those two functions. Um, so that's, that's basically it. This has been a very basic overview. If you want more details, we have several examples in our Foreman storybook. Uh, if you've never seen the storybook before, it's pretty cool. You just run npm run stories in your Foreman uh, dev environment, and it, it will start a web server. You go to that web page, and you get a page that looks like this, and you can uh, kind of explore all of the React components in Foreman. Uh, and Foreman modal has several examples with code and everything for you. So that is it for my intro to form and modal. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, next up, Lukash with IPv6 provisioning support. Yep, hello. Hope you can see my terminal and you can hear me. Yes, we can. Great. So, um, during this sprint, I was working on IPv6 provisioning over UFI HTTP boot. It's not uh, something necessarily that has been merged. The code is actually there for some time, but the last bits uh, were changed by eBoot in the installer, uh, and now it's um, completely, you know, uh, managed to install, and I'll describe what you can achieve the, today. Uh, so what I'm, what we're looking at is uh, this is the VM in uh, in uh, my libvirt. Uh, running Catello 3.14, uh, which is the latest stable. Um, 
and um, so what I actually did is uh, this is actually um, um, IPv6 only network. It's basically a NAT uh, network within Libvirt without any DHCP services. Um, and I have static address. Uh, this is my actually network uh, over here, like ABC. That's nice to remember. I form my solution to DNS for now, and the firewall firewall is trusted. And then what I did, and I'll be you know creating a tutorial or blog post or probably a, a documentation actually uh, from this. So don't worry. Uh, uh, at home here, uh, this Libvirt uh, network don't have a native IPv6 connection to the internet, and I need that to download uh, Red Hat content and other stuff. So what I'm uh, running, actually, I'm running a HTTP proxy on my hypervisor, my Fedora workstation, running on 8888. So this is what I did. I configured this for Git and you know for the for the system uh, itself. Then um, let then. Um, uh, then I just go ahead and um, went ahead and uh, installed uh, Catella. You know, nothing really special there. And I applied actually two patches, and both those patches are, are installed patches. So, you know, it, it made sure that the install passes through. Uh, we had uh, two tiny uh, issues with the DNS uh, module, but uh, it's been sorted now. And this is already in the master, so this will be part on, of Foreman 2.0. What else do we have? Uh, yeah, then I created a HTTP proxy within Foreman, uh, like in the Foreman user interface, or I've done this using a hammer, create a new proxy. Uh, you don't need to do this if you have IPv6 uh, native connectivity. And I made this uh, proxy a default one, then I imported manifest and synced the Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. Uh, 8.1, I guess, that was the version. And then what I did uh, was, oh yeah, I didn't show you actually, sorry, uh, installer. Yeah, so the installer command was pretty pretty simple. Um, there is one more workaround I had to do in the customer here. I had to, um, you know, make sure that this Dynflow core listen is set to, uh, to uh, localhost. And then, for HTTP UFI IPv6 provisioning, what we what we actually want is this is pretty much a standard uh, installation. What we don't want actually to enable is DNS. Uh, sorry, uh, DHCP. Uh, in this scenario, I'll describe in a minute. Uh, we don't use manage DHCP because um, DHCP format at the moment can't talk to the ISC DHCP6 or can't manage. Uh, DHCP6 addresses. This is pretty much problem of uh, DHCP itself, not of uh, Foreman, because ISC DHCP is don't have. Although it can uh, provide, it, it can provide uh, IPv6 management or IPv6, you know, serving IPv6 uh, networks. There is no API, so Foreman ca cannot actually do any updates, you know, adding new records or deleting records, and it will likely not happen uh, because ISC, the Internet Software Consortium, may developed a fairly new uh, software, open source software, which is called Kia, ISC Kia, and that one has a full IPv4 and 6 support, and it has a nice API. It's also open core architecture, which is uh, really surprising, but uh, but anyway, we don't have a plugin for that. So for this reason, we, you don't want to enable the uh, DHCP. What we can enable is DNS. DNS management of IPv6 networks is supported. Uh, and what we want to also install is uh, plugin uh, uh, HTTP boot somewhere here. It should be Woman Prox HTTP plugin. Which uh, actually, this plugin is also available for some time in Foreman. Uh, exposes the var lib tftp directory over HTTP protocol, and that's what we'll be using. So other than that, I'll make this. I'll make sure this is part of the documentation. Uh, it's uh, nothing special. And then uh, I've created a, a subnet using user interface. I'll show you the subnet uh, in a minute when I switch over to Foreman uh, user interface. And and then essentially uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So on this uh, satellite, uh, I'm also running DHCP6 and uh, RIDVD uh, the Slack uh, servers. So these are needed for IPv6 uh, uh, dynamic, uh, you know, uh, diamond. 
but these are not managed services like Foman can't manage TCP6 and can't manage uh, our RIDVD. So what it is actually is a configuration. And you can run these on any VM on your network. It doesn't need to be Scatola server, Foman server, satellite server. Uh, just for simplicity, I'm, ru I'm running it here. So as you can see, this is pretty much standard IPv6, you know, DCP6 configuration, nothing really special. Here's my network and here's my name server. And uh, for a HTTP UFI boot, the, the relevant section is this one, like uh, this UFI HTTP boot via IPv6. So what it actually does, it will, you know, pick a list from the pool, of course, and it will send this boot file URL, HTTP6 option, which points to the, actually, uh, this is smart proxy, so at port 8000, uh, slash EFI slash graph. This is actually content from the FTP directory. That's the essentially the same content that we have over TFTP, but it's being actually downloaded over HTTP. So this is not Pixie booting, this is actually HTTP booting. It's not, no longer called Pixie. And for the uh, for the R uh, DVD, the configuration is also very simple. This is like pretty much hello world in DHCP and R I D V D. It's uh, just you know subnet definition and 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 uh, name server. So this can be again this can be deployed on any other service. Like like this is external DHCP uh, and Swarman is not you know doing that. You just need to make sure this is returning the URL address that is pointing to Foreman. And the second and the last, uh, sorry, the, the last change I had to do is the, the grub that comes with RHEL 7, this is actually RHEL 7, is pretty old version of grub and I had to replace this, uh, the file grub x64 EFI with a new, new, new one from Fedora. So like it's this file, this var lib TFT. This actually is, I know this is confusing, this is TFTP directory, but we expose it via, uh, via HTTP here, and it's this one, uh, grab, oh uh, no, sorry, it's a grab2 slash grab this one, right? So this one, uh, I basically extracted this from Fedora. Other than, you need to do this because it won't work, like it will freeze, you know, there, there was a bug. It hasn't been backported yet uh, into uh, to, uh, RHEL. So this is pretty much it. And now well, let me show you how it works. So unshare, and I'm going to share my uh, window with uh, the instead subnets. Yes, this one. You should see my foreman. Now the subnet definition I've created. Can you make that a little bit bigger? Uh, clearly can't because then it will break up. You know, <laughs> sorry about yeah. that. Okay. I can, yeah, it's, it's breaking up. Let me, let me, let me see what I can do. I can maybe a little bit, yeah, just like that. So, so for provisioning, uh, I've created a, a network here, ABC uh, uh, 64. And essentially, um, essentially um, the workflow is that um, uh, when I turn on the um, my server, it would uh, do a HTTP 6 uh, request um, and it will get the response with uh, the, the, HT, the URL. It will download Grub. Grub will download its configuration. It will download its specific Mac-based configuration. And that configuration will contain uh, actually, uh, you know, a command line options for kernel for Dracut to initialize the HTTP, sorry, to initialize, yeah, uh, IPv6 stack and to um, uh, the, uh, the kickstart URL, the for URL. Here, there's one snag. Um, there's a bug in uh, RHEL 8, or all essentially all RHEL versions, the IPv6 DHCP in Anaconda, in actually Dracut doesn't uh, initialize correctly DNS. And the workaround is actually to make sure that the primary DNS server is filled here. This will render to name server equals something in the kickstart template, uh, sorry, in the in the Pixie grub template. So you need to have this, this is very important. IPMI can be actually, because we're using DHCP for the initial bootstrapping of the, you know, loader, but then, then you can either manually assign, I'm, I'm manually assigning IP addresses from in my case, but you can also use the database that's foreman, you know, uh, makes a sequence of uh, addresses or um, EUE64 is like, you know, uh, generating IPv6 address from MAC address. 
And boot mode should be DHCP. It's just right now I'm testing this with static. Uh, so static actually, although the boot mode is set to static, the for the HTTP UEFI boot, you actually need to have DHCP server that it does the bootstrap and only then, uh, um, you know, Pixie template renders the IPv6 template you give it to the to, to the host. Uh, renders to the uh, command line and from there it would be static uh, allocation however it works bo with both um it, it's just set to static because i'm actually testing this right now as we as we speak so i'm going to create a new host um uh, hopefully hitting the uh, time time schedule here uh so default organization location um, i'll do this a little bit smaller so it just renders a little bit better so I, I'm, i'll be using library here content view on content source fm ip6 no puppet no open scope no ansible uh operating system 64 right at 81 sync content partition table default and now this is important like we, we're doing here this is not a pixie anymore you know ipv so why we're doing that we have decided to do ipv6 provisioning only on ip uh, sorry only on ufi http just we thought that it's that's the best you know scenario we can do it's like a modern way of booting uh, systems over the network so that's what we tested for now of course i'm not saying it won't work with pixie you can try but we haven't tested that uh you know something here and then here i'm gonna quickly grab a thumb a mac address um, and domain this is associated with my subnet and you know right now i have like what let me type random uh, ip address here and hit submit okay so we have a we have a host here so now i'm going to switch over stop sharing start sharing and uh, application window and this is and this is you should see now my uh, efi virtual machine so this is brand new efi virtual machine in libert going to launch it and I'm going, going to quickly uh, press escape. So this is Fineware. This is like EFI and Fineware uh, of QEMU. And I'm going to visit boot maintenance manager, boot options, change boot order, because by default it will do Pixie 4, 6, uh, HTTP 4, and HTTP 6 is only the fourth option. We don't want to wait so long. So I'm going to pull this up. And if this fails, I want to see the shell, internal shell. F10 is save, yes, and go back and reset. So now what we should see is this box now uh, will perform DHCP v6 uh, uh, request. It should get uh, an address from the unmanaged server. And now this is important. Never ever do, uh, click on the first one. Uh, um, you need to click on the, you need to select the second option, the Pixie Grab to HTTP boot. If you do that, this will not only fail, but actually there's a bug, and I have reported this for Grub2 uh, in Bugzilla. It hasn't been fixed yet. It will actually corrupt the Grub in a way that it won't actually load, uh, even if you select the, the, the correct option. It just there's some kind of memory leak or something, or some overflow. The, the next thing you don't need to worry about, and I have a Bugzilla for that, is are, are these uh, errors. These are actually warnings, and you don't need to press any key. It will continue in five seconds automatically. So for some reason, it has some troubles parsing our HTTP address with port. I'm not sure if that uh, the, the, the uh, colon uh, 8000 is the problem, or I, I, I don't really, I didn't investigate. Uh, I have reported that to, uh, to the Grub2 um, maintainers. Uh, so it's luckily it's just a warning so just you know unattended starts i haven't pressed uh, any key it's just not sure why the why there is press any key however what we see now is um, uh, a vm uh, running on ipv6 only uh, network this was loaded from http so no pixie no tftp at all and now anaconda is starting up bringing up the network and it will start automating uh, with automated installation installation so this is pretty much what we have, uh, and I will I'll be I'll be working on a blog post or an article or something that would sum this up. Uh, and I really am hoping to see the more feedback and your uh, your questions and problems. <laughs> that's that's all I have for today.
Thank you, Lukash. I'm sure you'll get a lot of questions later on. Uh, and to our last presenter today, first time presenting with us, so thank you for joining us. Um, Leo, Leo about searching in uh, taxonomies in the main menu. Yeah, hello. So let me share the screen. Patient window. Yes. Yeah. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, cool. So my change, my additional is really small. Basically, some customers were having troubles when, in the case when they have like too many organizations or too many locations. So looking for the organization was sometimes quite really difficult. So what I added was is this small search box when the users try to search for, for example, for the USA organization, they will see only related stuff to the what they search. The same thing is here for the location. So they can search by string like Czech Republic or anything what they want. And yes, that's basically what I added. Really small feature. I hope it will help some customers. Yeah, that's everything from me. I'm sure that it will help. Thank you. Okay. So that was it for today. Thank you for all the presenters. Thank you for watching and see you next time.